Well, here we are, folks, at the beginning of a new month. It is December the 1st, day 334 in our journey through the Bible. It is the last month of 2022. We're still here. We're still doing what we do. We're still listening to this amazing book. This book that directs us to the source of life. And we've been doing this for nine years now, every day, showing up with you. And what a joy, what an absolute privilege. I can't believe it, folks. You've got one month left in 2022. Let's live it. Let's do our best to take it all in, to receive all that there is, to give what God has asked us to give to offer ourselves in service to others and to live with joy. Good news, said the angels. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. So today, friends, we're going to receive the joyful news that we hear in the book of Romans, chapters 9 through 12. That is on the menu today. Father, thank you so much for drawing us here. Sisters and brothers all around the world, we come because you've drawn us. Help us to hear. Romans chapter 9. With Christ as my witness, I speak with utter truthfulness, my conscience and the Holy Spirit confirm it. My heart is filled with bitter sorrow and unending grief for my people My Jewish brothers and sisters, I would be willing to be forever cursed, cut off from Christ, if that would save them. They are the people of Israel, chosen to be God's adopted children. God revealed his glory to them. He made covenants with them and gave them his law. He gave them the privilege of worshiping him and receiving his wonderful promises. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are their ancestors, and Christ himself was an Israelite as far as his human nature is concerned. And he is God, the one who rules over everything and is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. Well then, has God failed to fulfill his promise to Israel? No. For not all who are born into the nation of Israel are truly members of God's people. Being descendants of Abraham doesn't make them truly Abraham's children. For the scriptures say, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted, though Abraham had other children too. This means that Abraham's physical descendants are not necessarily children of God. Only children of the promise are considered to be Abraham's children. For God had promised, I will return about this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. This son was our ancestor Isaac. When he married Rebekah, she gave birth to twins. But before they were born, before they had done anything good or bad, she received a message from God. This message shows that God chooses people according to his own purposes. He calls people, but not according to their good or bad works. She was told, Your older son will serve your younger son. In the words of the scriptures, I loved Jacob, but I rejected Esau. Are we saying then that God was unfair? Of course not. For God said to Moses, I will show mercy to anyone I choose, and I will show compassion to anyone I choose. So it is God who decides to show mercy. We can neither choose it nor work for it. For the scriptures say that God told Pharaoh, I have appointed you for the very purpose of displaying my power in you and to spread my fame throughout the earth. So you see, God chooses to show mercy to some, and he chooses to harden the hearts of others, so they refuse to listen. Well, then you might say, why does God blame people for not responding? Haven't they simply done what he makes them do? No, don't say that. Who are you, a mere human being, to argue with God? Should the thing that was created say to the one who created it, why have you made me like this? When a potter makes jars out of clay... Doesn't he have the right to use the same lump of clay to make one jar for decoration and another to throw garbage into? In the same way, even though God has the right to show his anger and his power 
He is very patient with those on whom his anger falls, who are destined for destruction. He does this to make the riches of his glory shine even brighter on those to whom he shows mercy, who are prepared in advance for glory. And we are among those whom he selected both from the Jews and from the Gentiles. Concerning the Gentiles, God says in the prophecy of Hosea, Those who were not my people, I will now call my people. And I will love those whom I did not love before. And then at the place where they were told, You are not my people, there they will be called children of the living God. And concerning Israel, Isaiah the prophet cried out, Though the people of Israel are as numerous as the sand on the seashore, only a remnant will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth quickly and with finality. And Isaiah said the same thing in another place. If the Lord of heaven's armies had not spared a few of our children, we would have been wiped out like Sodom, destroyed like Gomorrah. What does all this mean? Even though the Gentiles were not trying to follow God's standards, they were made right with God. And it was by faith that this took place. But the people of Israel who tried so hard to get right with God by keeping the law never succeeded. Why not? Because they were trying to get right with God by keeping the law instead of by trusting in Him. They stumbled over the great rock in their path. God warned them of this in the Scriptures when He said, I am placing a stone in Jerusalem that makes people stumble, a rock that makes them fall. But anyone who trusts in Him will never be disgraced. Romans 10 Dear brothers and sisters, the longing of my heart and my prayer to God is for the people of Israel to be saved. I know what enthusiasm they have for God, but it is misdirected zeal, for they don't understand God's ways of making people right with Himself. Refusing to accept God's way, they cling to their own way of getting right with God by trying to keep the law. For Christ has already accomplished the purpose for which the law was given. As a result, all who believe in Him are made right with God. For Moses writes that the law's way of making a person right with God requires obedience to all of its commandments. But faith's way of getting right with God says, Don't say in your heart who will go up to heaven to bring Christ down to earth, and don't say who will go down to the place of the dead to bring Christ back to life again. In fact, it says, the message is very close at hand. It is on your lips and in your hearts. And that message is the very message about faith that we preach. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. As the scriptures tell us, Anyone who trusts in Him will never be disgraced. Jew and Gentiles are the same in this respect. They have the same Lord, who gives generously to all who call on Him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And how can they call on Him to save them unless they believe in Him? And how can they believe in Him if they have never heard about Him? And how can they hear about Him unless someone tells them, and how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say, How beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring good news. But not everyone welcomes the good news. For Isaiah the prophet said, Lord, who has believed our message? So faith comes from hearing, that is, hearing the good news about Christ. But I ask, have the people of Israel actually heard the message? Yes, they have. The message has gone throughout the earth, and the words to all the world. But I ask, did the people of Israel really understand? Yes, they did. For even in the time of Moses, God said, I will rouse your jealousy through people who are not even a nation. I will provoke your anger through the foolish Gentiles. And later Isaiah spoke boldly for God, saying, I was found by people who were not looking for me. I showed myself to those who who were not asking for me. But regarding Israel, God said, All day long I opened my arms to them. But they were disobedient 
and rebellious. Romans 11 I ask then, has God rejected his own people, the nation of Israel? Of course not. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham and a member of the tribe of Benjamin. No, God has not rejected his own people, whom he chose from the very beginning. Do you realize what the scriptures say about this? Elijah the prophet complained to God about the people of Israel and said, Lord, they've killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. And do you remember God's reply? He said, No, I have 7,000 others who have never bowed down to Baal. It is the same today. For a few of the people of Israel have remained faithful because of God's grace, His undeserved kindness in choosing them. And since it is through God's kindness, then it is not by their good works. For in that case, God's grace would not be what it really is, free and undeserved. So this is the situation. Most of the people of Israel have not found the favor of God they are looking for so earnestly. A few have, the ones God has chosen, but the hearts of the rest were hardened. As the scriptures say, God has put them into a deep sleep. To this day he has shut their eyes so they do not see him and closed their ears so they do not hear. Likewise, David said, Let their bountiful table become a snare, a trap that makes them think all is well. Let their blessings cause them to stumble, and let them get what they deserve. Let their eyes go blind so they cannot see, and let their backs be bent forever. Did God's people stumble and fall beyond recovery? Of course not. They were disobedient. So God made salvation available to the Gentiles. But he wanted his own people to become jealous and claim it for themselves. Now if the Gentiles were enriched because the people of Israel turned down God's offer of salvation, think how much greater a blessing the world will share when they finally accept it. I'm saying all this especially for you Gentiles. God has appointed me as the apostle to the Gentiles. I stress this. For I want somehow to make the people of Israel jealous of what you Gentiles have, so I might save some of them. For since their rejection meant that God offered salvation to the rest of the world, their acceptance will be even more wonderful. It will be life for those who were dead, and since Abraham and the other patriarchs were holy, their descendants will also be holy. Just as the entire batch of dough is holy because the portion given as an offering is holy. For if the roots of the tree are holy, the branches will be too. But some of these branches from Abraham's tree, some of the people of Israel, have been broken off, and you Gentiles, who were branches from a wild olive tree, have been grafted in. So now you also receive the blessing God has promised Abraham and his children, sharing in the rich nourishment from the root of God's special olive tree. But you must not brag about being grafted in to replace the branches that were broken off. You are just a branch, not the root. Well, you may say, those branches were broken off to make room for me. Yes, but remember, those branches were broken off because they didn't believe in Christ, and you are there because you do believe. So don't think highly of yourself, but fear what could happen. For if God did not spare the original branches, he won't spare you either. Notice how God is both kind and severe. He is severe towards those who disobey, but kind to you if you continue to trust in His kindness. But if you stop trusting, you also will be cut off. And if the people of Israel turn from their unbelief, they will be grafted in again. For God has the power to graft them back into the tree. You, by nature, were a branch cut from a wild olive tree. So if God is willing to do something contrary to nature by grafting you into his cultivated tree, he will be far more eager to graft the original branches back into the tree where they belong. I want you to understand this mystery, dear brothers and sisters, so that you will not feel proud about yourselves. Some of the people of Israel have hard hearts, but this will last only until the full number of Gentiles comes to Christ. And so all Israel will be saved. As the scriptures say, the one who rescues will come from Jerusalem 
and he will turn Israel away from ungodliness. And this is my covenant with them, that I will take away their sins. Many of the people of Israel are now enemies of the good news, and this benefits you Gentiles. Yet they are still the people he loves, because he chose their ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For God's gifts and his call can never be withdrawn. Once you Gentiles were rebels against God, but when the people of Israel rebelled against him, God was merciful to you instead. Now they are the rebels, and God's mercy has come to you, so that they too will share in God's mercy. For God has imprisoned everyone in disobedience, so he could have mercy on everyone. Oh, how great are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge! How impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and his ways! For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to give him advice? And who has given him so much that he needs to pay it back? For everything comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for his glory. All glory to him forever. Amen. Romans 12. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. In His grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in your confident hope, be patient in trouble, and keep on praying. And keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy, and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people and don't think you know it all. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge, I will pay them back, says the Lord. If your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. And now, Lord, help us to know the way of love, the ways that you've shown us here through your servant Paul. Amen. Don't copy, 
and don't pretend. Dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. So often we think that Paul's just talking about worldly behavior, telling people not to copy the destructive habits of the world, and no doubt he's cautioning against that. But that's not all he's warning us away from. He's telling us not to copy the world's picture of piety. We are not to parrot out pious behavior that we see in other people, thinking that somehow this is going to justify us before God. He wants us to renew our minds in the gospel, what Christ has done for us, and the reality of Christ's presence in us. So don't copy the behaviors of this world, whether through license or religious performance. Life is not found in either of those things. We are to renew our minds in the reality of what is, and that is what Christ has done, accomplished, finished, and the reality of his presence now with us. That is where real life is found. So don't copy. Rather, let us discover this new life. And let us have our minds renewed with what is the truth. Then in verse 9, Paul says, Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Because of Christ's life that is born in you, a life that is based on God's kindness toward you and rooted in his mercy for you, you have been given the privilege of learning to really love. He empowers you to express his love to those nearest and closest to you and to those who are far away, even your enemies. We can live in harmony with one another, not paying back evil with evil. We can be honorable towards one another, living at peace, not taking revenge, but trusting in God. We can learn to live and love without copying and not pretending. All of this is accomplished not by us, but by Christ who lives in us. He teaches and he empowers us to live and to love. And the prayer of my heart is that I will not copy and I will not pretend. Instead, I will live the life that is mine now in him, through him, and for him. And that's a prayer that I have for my family too. For my wife and my daughters and my son. And that's a prayer that I have for you. May it be so. Well, hey, hey, my sisters and my brothers. So glad to have you on this journey here on this last month of 2022. We've only got a few days left, my friends. And I love this season of the year. It is a wonderful time to have our hearts renewed, strengthened, healed, encouraged. And boy, this time of year brings out all of those needs in our hearts. I know that many of you are having a hard time this time of year. For many, it's a time where we remember those that are not here, what is absent and what is lost. And for you, my sister, my brother, I pray God's comfort would blanket your heart, would be ever present in your mind as you walk through these difficult days. And for those that rejoice, I want to rejoice with you in your overflowing gratitude for all that God has done. These are both a part of our lives. This is the very nature of our lives together. And I guess that last point is, is most important in the face of the bitter and the sweet. Together, that word. That we don't have to do this alone. We don't have to walk through the valleys of the shadow of death alone. No, this can be shared. And the same with the mountaintops, the sweet victories, 
they too are meant to be shared. So in a small way, I know it's an in, just a, a very, very small way. What we desire in this podcast is to share a part of your day where we can encourage you, where we can bless you, where we can do this thing that we're doing together. And also to remind all of our hearts that we are together with Christ. We've been drawn into his life, that he is with us. He's together with us right now, no matter what we're going through. So bless you, dear hearts. Blown away that we get to do this together. Hey, I just want to send a thank you and a shout out to some folks. These are folks that have partnered with us so that this podcast can do what we're doing. So a big thank you and a big shout out to Gerald Quinn, Joshua Torres, Martha Harris, Celeste Dorn, Ted Brooks, William Faulkner, and Cheryl Amberger. Bless you, my sisters and my brothers. And if you're listening to this podcast and you would like to partner with us to help us to do this thing, boy, it is so appreciated and so needed. All you have to do is head on over to the webpage and click on the donate link and you'll be on your way. Well, I'm going to be on my way on this fine December day. What do you say we all show up again tomorrow and let's do it again together. Lord willing and the creek don't rise. Your brother Hunter plans on being here. Until then, let's go forward. Let's go forward in God's joy. Let's let his joy be our strength. And let us always remember this. That you are not alone. And you are loved. No doubt about that. Alrighty, I'll talk to you again tomorrow. You guys take care.